I hate staying home alone. We just recently moved to our new house. My dad bought it in an auction. The house was better than our previous one. It had a big pool in the backyard and a small garden beside of it. There was a big tree in the garden which grew scented yellow flowers. The backyard is probably the only reason why I was excited to move into this house. The house was also close to my college, which was another great benefit. Both of my parents travel a lot, hence I am accustomed to staying by myself at home some nights. We had tight securities and alarms all around this new house too. There was no way one could break in without setting the alarm off, so I never had anything to worry about. At the back of our house, there stood an old three-story apartment. I saw people on the first and ground floor, but the second floor felt like no one stays there. The second story's bedroom window was faced directly at the backside of our house. It was a calm and quiet community, so I kind of like chilling while my parents are gone. One weekend, my parents were off to visit my sick aunt in Lay. I stayed back at home like usual. It was a Saturday night. Hence, all my friends wanted to hang out at a friend's house. I promised my parents not to stay out late, so after a couple of beers, I came back home. It was 9 p.m., and I wasn't feeling sleepy at all. I went upstairs and got in my bathing suit and went for a swim in the pool. It was a hot summer night. I poured myself a glass of fresh orange juice and put on some music. I swam for some time. Then I drank juice while lying on my pool raft and fell asleep eventually. Suddenly, I heard a noise. I woke up from my slumber. The backyard was all empty. No one was around. Just then, my eyes went to the second floor window of the nearby building. A frail, pale old woman was standing in front of the window looking directly at me. Her eyes were so big that her stare kind of freaked me out. I didn't say anything. I looked at my watch, and it was around 10 p.m. I kept on lying on my raft, thinking she would leave on her own. After a couple of minutes, when I looked back up, she was gone. I felt relieved and kept thinking to myself, how come I'd never seen her from before? I always thought that no one lives in the second floor apartment. I heard my phone ringing inside the house, so I came out of the pool thinking it could be my parents. I went inside and closed the door behind me. As I walked to get my phone, I heard a whispering voice coming from behind, and I froze. It was an old woman's voice. I slowly looked around, and my heart drowned in horror. That old, creepy woman was standing behind me. I had no idea how she got into the house. Her wide, cold death stare made my legs numb. I couldn't walk away, even though I wanted to so badly. I spoke in a broken voice. Ma'am, how did you? How did you get inside? She slightly opened her toothless mouth and said, Isabel, are you still here? Run away now, or your husband will come and bury you there. Then, she lifted her weak, lean hand and pointed towards the tree in our garden with her long, creepy fingers. My blood turned to ice. I replied in a shaky voice, Oh my God, what are you saying? She didn't answer just kept staring at the tree, and then back to my face. Her mouth opened, and eyes widened. It was such a horrible sight. Suddenly, my phone again rang, and I ran towards my room frantically this time. I got inside my room and locked the door. It was my dad. I answered the phone and started sobbing terribly. My dad got all freaked out and called 9 to 1 on my behalf. The cops came after 10 minutes. I was still in my room. I took my time and slowly approached the door. By this time, the old lady was gone. I told the cops everything. They immediately went to the building and asked a guy about the tenant on the second floor. It came out as a shock that the apartment is empty for the last two years. But the guy also said that an old lady used to live in the apartment back then. She was sick and bedridden. Hence, she spent most of the time of her days sitting near that window inside the dark room. Her children left her alone during her last days, and she even died sitting near that window. Two cops stayed back with me that night. The next morning when my parents arrived, the cops told them I might have had a bad dream or something. While they were talking, something popped in my mind. 
I asked my dad what the name was for the previous owners of our house. He said the bank told him a woman lived with her husband in this house before we moved in. Her name was Isabel Monroe, and it was two years ago. Why are you asking? My dad added. My heart started to beat fast. I told them the old woman addressed me as Isabel and said her husband buried her under that tree. They all looked very surprised. The cops decided to check our backyard. When they dug under the tree, scaring the hell out of everyone, a skeleton of a full-grown woman got discovered from our garden. It had a ring on its left hand. My mom was completely paranoid. And so was me and my dad from the thought of knowing that a dead person was buried in the backyard without our knowledge. The cops investigated this matter, and they came to know that it was indeed the remains of the woman named Isabel. She went missing one night, and her husband filed a missing person report. But after filing that report, he too left town. Due to a lack of evidence, the police couldn't find any details about her. Also, no one came to interrogate about her. Her autopsy reports signify that she was murdered by a serious injury made with a blunt object on the back of her head. The cops suspect it was her husband who murdered her and buried her under that tree. They are still searching for her husband. I am very much sure that the old lady saw this entire incident from her room's window, but couldn't tell anyone. Even though people find it hard to believe, I think she came back to tell me about it. And I believe it was her ghost that I saw that night. But the question that kept eating my mind was, why me? This too got answered when the cops published Isabel's picture in the local newspaper, stating about this gruesome case. Isabel looks exactly like me. Or should I say, I look exactly like her. My parents are still in deep shock. I have no idea what to say. We are still living in this house, and I haven't seen that old lady ever again. A few years ago, my aunt and her husband hired me to babysit for them. It was Halloween weekend, and they were going out to a party somewhere. Their son Josh, who was only 10 months old at the time, was a really simple kid to take care of. He rarely cried, and was really no trouble whatsoever. To top it off, he was super cute, still is. Anyway, I arrive at their place, and they head off to their party saying that they'll be back before 11 p.m., and that if there's any problems, to call them immediately. The night was mostly routine. A couple of trick-or-treaters came to the door, but other than that, it was just me watching TV. The baby was asleep upstairs, and I had the monitor with me at all times. I also made sure to check up on him every 10 minutes or so. Call me paranoid, but whatever. I just wanted to make sure that he was okay. It's around 11.30 p.m. great. My aunt and uncle are taking longer than they said. I'm watching a Nick Cage movie while struggling to stay awake. This turned out to be a losing battle. I end up closing my eyes for what I thought was just a moment, but when I opened them and checked the clock, I realized I'd been asleep for almost half an hour. Ha! Huh. Fantastic. Nearly midnight, and they're still not back. I pick up the baby monitor and immediately, something doesn't sound quite right. Baby Josh isn't crying or anything. I can hear his peaceful little breaths clearly through the device, but there's a slight creaking that seemed out of place. It sounded like the floorboards. Surely he hadn't gotten out of his cot and started taking his first steps. I couldn't help but wonder what that sound was. I get an uncomfortable feeling swell up inside me. I make my way to the foot of the stairs and instinctively, uncomfortably, I lightly call out Joshi. I'm coming up now. I walk up the creaky steps and into where Josh was sleeping. He was laying there, completely comfortable and snug as a bug. Nothing seemed out of place or unusual. I watch over him for a few moments and for whatever reason, decide to stay with him until his parents arrive. After another half an hour, I hear their car finally pull into the driveway. They enter the house, and I make my way downstairs to greet them. I expect them to ask how things were, or to give a friendly, sorry for being late. But instead, the first thing they ask me is, why is the spare key in the door? I went outside to check, and there it was. A key was in the front door, 
which obviously wasn't there when the pair had gone off to their party. They had both forgotten that they'd left a spare under the doormat, and only remembered when they saw it. The door itself was still unlocked when they arrived back home. My uncle ran inside it and searched the whole place thoroughly. Whoever had used that key to gain entrance to the house was now gone. I still don't know how they managed to sneak out under my very nose. Four months after this incident, a human trafficking ring was busted in our area. The group didn't discriminate based on age. They'd sell women and young girls into domestic or sexual slavery, and babies to the highest bidder. Usually, this would be to people in the Far East that wanted a white child. But I guess all sorts of people were potential buyers. According to my uncle's friend who's in the force, it seems likely that this group had been staking out their house and realized that the spare key had been left under the mat. They didn't bother to rob the house when the whole family was out though. They were waiting until the baby became an easy target. Given enough time, an opportunity was bound to arise. When it did that Halloween night, they took it, and I'm damn thankful that I woke up when I did. Thank God for baby monitors. That's all I can say. I am a 26-year-old female. I was curious to see what this Facebook dating had to offer, and I saw a profile picture of this guy called Lee. He's 31. He commented on my picture. He told me I had a lovely smile, and he would like to get to know me. So I began to contact him, and we exchanged numbers. We got to know each other on WhatsApp at first, and he told me all the things I liked to hear about which were baking, castles, and villages. When I first met up with him in a cafe he seemed okay at first, just average. He was timid and nervous around me, and I just thought it was that. I decided to give him a chance and go for a second date. At that time I felt like I could trust him, and he wasn't the type of guy that would harm me. I went in his car for this second date, and he took me to his area in the villages and I liked everything I saw, and I liked the restaurant he took me in. I went to his house to watch the movie. Then he bought me chocolates and baking books. I decided to tell my parents about him as I kept going out with him. I was in his house and we watched The Saw. It was a sheer horror story kind of film. Not the type of film I would watch, but he knew I didn't like it, but he kept watching it. I decided to go out with him because it's nearly his birthday. He drove me to the seaside and we went to the restaurant. It was very late at 822. Then he drove me back, and while he was taking me home on the motorway, he said that he didn't want me to see him in a different light. He had got to tell me something. He had been arrested for going on child porn. He kept sharing these underage girls' images. They were his age at first, then they got younger, and he did it at 22, and he did it at school on a computer. He made an excuse to say he was blackmailed into them. I felt so sick to my stomach, but had to remain calm and make him believe I wanted to still be with him so he could drive me back home. I felt so so uncomfortable at that point and so dumb that I wanted to get home and straight away block him. I felt like I was in danger and didn't know what he would do to me if I screamed at him. Then he kept going on about his ex like he was obsessed with her over the things she's done. He drove me back home. I came home at around 10.45, and my mom saw I had a face that wasn't happy. I told my mom everything, and then we saw the article that he was a sex offender and had done 16 months in prison for downloading child porn level which comes under bestiality and sadism. I was shocked in horror, and I just broke up with him with text and blocked him. I also told him that I never wanted to see him again. If you like my advice, I wouldn't go on online dating. This is full of creeps and more so online. He then messages me on a different number on WhatsApp and tries to call me but I decline. My mom wanted to speak with this pedophile so she texted him on my mobile and said we all know what you've done and sent him the database article of his convictions. He carries on with the excuses saying he did those things after finding out about his adoption and he lost his jobs and self-harmed. I never felt sorry for him. All I saw was him trying to justify his actions, but there was nothing to justify it. 
He thought my parents were trying to control me to not speak to him, so he put out messages that says you should allow your daughter to talk to me. He then said he loved me and became deluded thinking I felt the same. I blocked him and kept the messages for authority. Then a week passed. I thought he could move on, but then I got a message at 12.22 a.m. from a different number from Lee pretending to be his mom. Now I know it's not his mom because of his misspellings and his awful grammar. He tried to blackmail me into feeling sorry for him emotionally. I replied and said I don't want Lee to contact me. Then he said his final goodbyes, and it went quiet. I didn't block the number because I wanted more evidence for the police to read more messages from him. Then the next week he texted me about jobs and how he was still thinking about me. He mentioned the hospice name where I worked, and I was worried he would try to get close to me by working or volunteering there. I wasn't too sure if he meant another kitchen workplace with the same name. I just sent screenshots to the police and built a case against him, and they said they would visit him and tell him to stop. I saw he had a photo of him and I on his Facebook, saying that he hoped we would be together. I wouldn't say I liked every bit of it, and wished he took it down. I saw he liked the memory tree of the place I work, and I'm worried that he will show up at my workplace. He knows my house address, and there was a new person called Charlie that was going to be doing shift at my place at the coffee shop, and I'm worried that this Lee would be a false name for Charlie. I felt so paranoid, but then I think to myself, always expect the unexpected. I tried contacting by email to the police dealing with it and told them my concerns, but I never got a reply back or a call. I feel so powerless at this point. I put him on another sex offender database to share awareness. Now I try and look out for a black Puget whenever I'm outside. I will never forget this nightmare of an experience. I was worried that Charlie would be a false name for Lee.